Okay, this is the reductionism holism debate. Um, I'm going to look at both of these issues and their evaluation. So just to start with a, a kind of in a nutshell, reductionism is an approach that breaks complex behaviour down into simple components, such as biological elements. Holism, on the other hand, is an approach that looks at the whole thing rather than just the constituent parts of behaviour. Um, it's looking at the, the way that all the different elements work together to, to produce a complex behaviour. And we'll look first of all at reductionism. Um, we consider levels of behaviour when we look at reductionism. So you can see these three levels here. If you look at the lowest level, that would be things like biological, physiological explanations like genes or brain structure or neurochemical elements. And anything on this element would be considered reductionist. If you think about um, a complex behaviour like aggression, for example, um, and you're picking out one tiny element such as uh, one gene, and saying um, that that's an important part in it. Actually, that's uh, failing to consider the way that genes interact with other parts, other levels of behaviour. So that's why it would be considered reductionist. Um, you've got the middle level would be things like behavioural factors, conditioning, so on, cognitive factors, schemas, models, um, social influence, conformity, and so on. At the highest level, you'd consider it on a socio-cultural level. So you'd look at the effect of our culture on our behaviour, how our behaviour influences the way that we, we live and where we live. So just to give you a quick example of that, at the highest level, that socio-cultural level, if we were looking at memory, we might look at how cultural expectations affect what we remember. We might have more vivid memories where someone did something that went against the grain of our culture and we might remember that really vividly. That's a result of cultural expectations. On the other hand, if we went down the levels then, at the middle level we'd be looking at things like cognitive explanations, the working memory model, different kinds of memory, episodic memories and all of that. At the lowest level we'd be looking at things like um, areas of the brain where memories are stored, neurotransmitters involved in forming memories. And those would be considered reductionist because it's taking one, one single part of the whole and focusing on that part only. Whereas actually it, um, someone who was taking a holistic approach would argue that that's not an acceptable um, way to study behaviour because you ought to look at how the different part, different levels of behaviour interact together to produce this complex approach. Complex behaviour, sorry. Right, different types of reductionism then. The first type, biological reductionism. Um, fairly straightforward, what it says on the tin, biological psychologists reduce behaviour to the actions of neurons, neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, environmental reductionism is where um, you explain behaviour in terms of simple stimulus response links. So again, you're narrowing it down to a simple factor. You're looking at a simple relationship between behaviour and events, events in the environment. So that's environmental reductionism, because again, it's considering one part of behaviour and not how it interacts with the other levels of behaviour. Experimental reductionism, then, is where we use experimental and lab approaches um, to reduce, but in, in doing that you have to reduce a really complex behaviour down to a simple set of variables so that you can investigate them, so that you can just change the independent variable and keep everything else constant. So you have to reduce something that's really complex down to a simple set of variables, so that's called experimental reductionism. Okay, we're going to eval evaluate each one of those. So if we think about biological reductionism, first of all, the good thing is that this has, it's a scientific approach um, and it's got credibility, it's got scientific support for the things that it's found. Um, a biologically reductionist approach has found some really important things. Um, it means we can easily test what's found, um, there's lots of control, you can predict behaviour and so on. Um, it, it means that you can develop drug therapies. So if um, we hadn't found out, for example, that um, the role of uh, serotonin in depression, we would um, not have any um, antidepressant drugs. Uh, we wouldn't know what if no one had taken a biologically reductionist approach, they wouldn't have been able to isolate that factor that was involved in depression and therefore to produce a treatment that uh, that deals with it. 
So um, those things have meant that there's been a reduction in institutionalisation. You can get people working again. Um, it, you know, we all want to have drug therapies available for illnesses such as that. And that's really important. Without reductionism, we wouldn't be able to identify some of these um, components that are involved in complex behaviours. On the other hand, it oversimplifies behaviour and devalues behaviour. And actually, drug therapies range in effectiveness. So if you ignore the higher levels of behaviour, you might be ignoring the cause of that behaviour while treating the symptoms. So you might be treating the symptoms of depression whilst ignoring the wider cause related to family issues or cultural issues or so on. OK, Envi evaluating environmental reductionism. Um, and it's good in terms of it can explain the behaviour of animals well in terms of simple components and it can explain human behaviour. Um, however, things like treatment of phobias with systematic desensitisation has a success rate of 75%. That's a good success rate, but that suggests that it's not a complete explanation um, because there's still 25% of people that don't respond to it. So um, we know that um, that it d certainly plays a role, but it's certainly not an, a complete environmental reductionism isn't able to explain behaviour completely. Okay, experimental reductionism. If we reduce behaviour to a form that can be studied, that's important and productive. It gives us insight and it can lead to positive outcomes. Um, this kind of links back to the biological one a little bit in terms of um, it does identify elements that affect behaviour, which is important. On the other hand, whether it tells us much about real life is the question. In real life there are factors that motivate performance that you can't recreate in a lab. A lot of this will be familiar to you from um, when you've looked at your research methods. If you think about um, eyewitness testimony again for this, um, things like anxiety in a real life situation can affect performance that can't be recreated in a lab. Um, and often when we compare lab results to real world, there are differences. OK, moving on to holism then, to look at that um, in contrast to reductionism. We often hear this phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's kind of what re what holism really thinks. Um, so if you look here, I've put, this is not a great example, but it, it, work with me. So you've got on the left the ingredients for a cake. Um, and on the right you've got the actual cake. If you look at the ingredients for a cake, you you wouldn't those you wouldn't look at those ingredients and think, oh that's just the same as a cake. Because it's not. There's there's a cake is different to just the ingredients that are that are in it. And in a sense, reductionism kind of just would just look at the flour in the cake. Um, and ignore everything else. It's ignoring the way that the different ingredients would interact together and also in combination with the way it's baked as well um, in order to produce something that's greater than a whole. Obviously this is a limited um, comparison but hopefully it helps you to understand what that phrase is going on about. Um, and holism argues that at each of these behaviour levels there are what we call emergent properties that can't be reduced down to the lowest level. What we mean by emergent properties, features of a whole that depend on parts interacting together. So if you look at these different levels, it's it's not enough, if you're taking a holistic approach, you would argue it's not enough to just look at, for example, neurochemical elements or to just look at cognitive elements. So it would say that actually there are, are features of the whole thing that depend on cognitive elements and neurochemical elements interacting between each other. So even if you try and ex if you find something valuable about the way that neurochemical elements affect a certain behavior, actually if you've studied it in isolation, it might behave differently in um, conjunction with behavioral elements, for example. So it's arguing that, um, that reductionism is um, an inaccurate approach for that reason. Right, why holism? So it's, it's saying that reductionist explanations are not appropriate when we want to understand subjective human experience, which is complex. We have to take the whole person into account. We lose those emergent properties, the way the different levels of behaviour interact together. We have to look at how those different parts all interact together. Here's some examples. So humanistic psychology would look at investigating all aspects of the individual. 
Gestalt psychology is mentioned in your booklet and you can see the example here on the right. Sometimes things that we see only make sense if we look at the whole thing, not the individual bits. So if you look at this picture on the right, if you look at the sort of Miss Pac-Man shapes um, and triangles just by themselves, one by one, then um, you see the shapes. But it's only if you look at the whole that, that you see the white triangle sitting on top. So sometimes things that we see only make sense if we look at the whole thing, not individual bits of it. Um, another example of holism, social psychology, where group behaviour shows characteristics that are greater than the sum of the individuals that make it up. For example, de-individuation only occurs in a group and it has characteristics that simply wouldn't occur if those individuals were by themselves. Abnormal psychology. Mental disorders are often explained in this way, um, where you look at the interaction between some of the different levels, thinking about stress diathesis model, if you've got a genetic vulnerability that's then triggered by something in your environment, therapy often takes more than one approach, cognitive behavioural therapy in conjunction with um, antidepressants or drugs of some sort. Right, advantages of a holistic approach then. It gives you a more complete understanding of behaviour. It looks at the big picture, takes more factors into consideration. There are some aspects of behaviour that you can only understand on a, a holistic level. Um, disadvantages, it's less scientific. So you can't do scientific testing in the same way because um, how do you test the way that different factors interact with each other? It's very much more difficult than looking at one simple factor and isolating that factor in an experiment. As um, explanations get more compl complex or complicated, the explanations, uh, the holistic explanations can get more vague. They're speculative, kind of slightly moving into guesswork. You've got a lack of empirical evidence to support it. Um, it gives a bit of a practical dilemma. So if you've got lots of factors that are contributing to a mental illness, how do you then establish which is the most important and which to use as a basis for therapy? So that's where your reductionist approach then is perhaps more strong than a holistic approach because you can isolate one element and um, focus on that and work out how important it is and so on. So a potential compromise is something called interactionism, which is an alternative approach to reductionism, which kind of focuses on how the different levels interact with one another. So that's um, perhaps a compromise between the two, which is uh, look kind of a, a partly reductionist approach, but also including the interaction of the different levels.